thanks Grant and uh, and uh, Davidson and company for having me and uh, for all of you to participate. Um, after four years, I've kind of figured out it is pretty well every time on Halloween. So uh, <laughs> first couple of years, I'm like, oh, man, this is just uh, odd. It just falls on either Halloween or I think the one year was after Halloween. But uh, I, I've, I've started to learn that I need to go to Guy's neighborhood, send the kids from my neighborhood to Guy's neighborhood. I never get as much as he does. And um, uh, one thing I was talking about uh, Halloween and having to do a presentation with my 12-year-old daughter today. And of course, she says, are, are you going to dress up? And I'm like, well, no, I got a presentation you know can't dress up and caught no of course I'll find you something so I said oh she's okay yeah you know just find me something that just blends in and you know, maybe guy you got a good knife in the head and she said oh you know what suit are you gonna I guess I'm gonna wear this blue suit she goes don't worry I'll find something for you they won't even know you're in costume so uh, <laughs> it was the old trust me so I said okay I'll, I'll, I'll trust you and uh, anyway here's what she came up with so. <laughs> so, <laughs> in, in honor of my 12-year-old daughter, I somehow am out there feeling like I'm just blending in. But it it kind of does go, um, but uh, anyway, I guess that just shows you, uh, you, you think you got it going on until you're humbled by your, uh, by your kids, and I think that's, uh, that's often a... Uh, a, uh, a good uh, reality check for us in life. So uh, in her honor, I'll wear it for a bit. Uh, maybe I won't wear it for too, too long. <laughs> Somehow, oh, yes, I, it's just a bit loose here. Uh-oh. And to blame Peter when he kicked that, not me. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, it's, it's hard to turn, but uh, it's warm. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Anyway, that's my quick intro. Uh, so in, in my presentation, I really want to kind of take, uh, take you, uh, you guys through a, a quick overview of the, the past, the present, and a bit of the insight into the future of where we are on, uh, on the BCSC and some of the things that, that we're working on and, um, and also the, uh, that we have been focused on. In terms of uh, the year that was, <clears throat> a lot of the, the, the past year, we summarize every year in a staff notice. Um, outlining our activities and our findings of our CD reviews, both um, full and uh, issue oriented. Um, in terms of the, the numbers, you know, put the pie chart out in terms of percentages as opposed to pure numbers, um, because I think every year our, our percentages are pretty consistent and just the total number of reviews uh, fluctuates. So this year we did 840. The previous year we did a thousand, um, and in terms of uh, why that fluctuates, we kind of try to focus on issue-oriented reviews um, to to tackle areas where where we're looking for something specific, and then we fill it in with uh, with full reviews as well. Some of the uh, the whys behind the um, the issue-oriented reviews sometimes is a specific accounting, legal, or regulatory issue that we want to take a look at. Um, and we want to do it quickly. Sometimes it's an emerging issue or an industry. Uh, and it's been a while, but certainly we do have a lot of emerging industries now that are a big focus of our marketplace and marketplaces around the world. Um, sometimes uh, it's implementation of a new rule. So we might make a change and we want to assess the compliance or uptake of that, uh, of that new uh, rule. And sometimes it's just information gathering. And this one's a bit of an odd one, but as we start to try to develop some of our um, our rules and direction of regulatory um, uh, uh, focus, sometimes we need to go out and gather information. And in particular at the BCSC, we really have a focus to uh, understand the problem before we go out and try to solve it. So we're trying to uh, often gather information um, to the extent of the problem that uh, it you know that that we can come up with an, something that will fix it and something that will fix it in a in a positive way not just to try to hit a uh, a, a nail with a sledgehammer so in in 2017 18 the the primary uh, issue oriented reviews that we had undertaken were mining technical oil and gas disclosure and that's typically looking at either reserve reports for the oil and gas or mining technical reports typically equates to about 
a quarter of our reviews every year. Uh, this year we did some information gathering on gender diversity and women's on boards, <clears throat> as well as some information gathering on climate change. Um, a big area for us in terms of, uh, of focus lately has been developing new rules for non-GAAP measures. So we did some issue-oriented reviews on that and, uh, and that tried to help us guide where our rules and, and policies were going. The one thing you'll, you'll notice that is missing from this uh, issue-oriented reviews is the, is the cannabis space. Um, we did a little bit of review early in the year um, as it related to U.S. Um, uh, companies with U.S. activities, and that tried to help uh, guide our, um, our staff notice on, on um, those in the cannabis space with exposure to U.S. activities. And after the year end, um, we did um, an issue oriented review on actual cannabis uh, uh, license producers and, and a, broader, um, a broader spectrum of cannabis, uh, those in the cannabis space. And that, um, that led into our um, staff notice that we issued on October 10th. <clears throat> in terms of the outcomes, um, our outcomes typically are fairly consistent year to year. Um, you know, there's, there's, um, there's different reasons for our reviews. You know, a lot of it's just education. So, you know, education and awareness is, is one piece of it. Um, obviously, we're trying to ensure that there's consistency, transparency within the marketplace of issuers. So, you know, there are aspects where referrals uh, to our enforcement, cease trades or defaults do occur. But I think if you thought about this um, this pie chart in a in, in kind of a holistic view, you'll see that compliance and and, and action typically equates to about twenty five percent per year, and the rest is uh, looking at prospective changes, education, awareness, and no action required. So we're really trying to get out there and guide issuers um, and and lead them to better results and uh, you know better results for for all stakeholders as opposed to just out there looking to punish. I think I'm gonna take this off now because it is getting, it's getting hot. It's actually quite warm and- um, Mike, you wanna try this? No, no, I was gonna, <laughs> but, but I will be able to, too, I will be able to say to my daughter that I did wear it and I don't, and then now we'll actually have the, uh, the video to uh, back that up and <laughs> somehow haunt me later on, but uh, I might, might need character witnesses down the road to, uh, to help me out of that bind. I know that, uh, Peter, you're worried about having a, a, yeah. a picture of cannabis behind you. I think I'm about, <laughs> might be, I'm not the only one to say cannabis. Yeah, I might be a little more worried than with my uh, monster hat on my head. Anyway, in terms of topical areas, then these are all outlined in that staff notice. On, um, on some of uh, the, the recurring issues. And um, one is the statement of cashless classifications. I think what we found is there's a lot of misclassification uh, in the statement of cash flows in some of the reviews that we were doing. Um, and a lot of it was uh, taking cash flows away from operating and putting them into investing or financing. So that's an area that, uh, that we wanted to highlight. Fair value measurement. <clears throat> this is an area that I can really kind of pegged to the cannabis space um, uh, because the the cannabis is is often at uh, have to has to be recorded as biological assets fair value less cost of sale um, that there's a lot of um, a lot of assumptions and inputs that have to go into determining that fair value they're often um, driven by what we call level three observations so some of that um, some of the aspects that we're looking at in terms of insufficient uh, disclosure of fair value measurement goes into the level three uh, concepts and um, and uh, you know the policies and procedures as well as lack of uh, sensitivity disclosure about uh, uh, changes and assumptions adoption of new accounting policies I think that was a fairly consistent one uh, it seems like only the topics change. Uh, last year we had revenue, this year we have leases. Um, what we're really looking for is more robust disclosure about how, how the change in policies will affect uh, your, the companies and um, trying to at least put some parameters around um, the impact. So that's one to, uh, to, to keep in mind. Um, probably also I could say, um, you know, in the MDNA side, 
some of these are consistent as well. You can see non-GAAP financial measures is one. Um, in the investment entities was uh, the outcome of a very focused review on uh, on in, in companies that were really viewing themselves as investment entities. And what we were finding is the MD&A just didn't have enough uh, disclosure about each investment. So there's some very specific um, uh, points in that staff notice that outline some of our expectations and how they were, weren't being met. Uh, Non-GAAP financial measures, uh, we put a specific staff notice on the real estate and that just had to do with um, uh, things we were seeing in the marketplace uh, regarding adjustments when real estate issuers were, were disclosing um, adjusted f uh, funds from operations. Um, a, a more general um, area that we consistently see um, uh, issues with in, la in lack of compliance is MD&A operations. Um, and here we start to see it highlighting more and more when issuers get into specific new emerging industries. Cannabis, crypto, is a, they'll come along and say, uh, was a mining company, now I'm cannabis, crypto, um, and I've got these grand plans. First MDNA comes along, hey, I've got these grand plans. But there's no specifics as to, uh, to how that plan's going to play out. And, and the things that I think about are, what is the plan? What's the timeline? What's the budget? Um, are there any regulatory and licensing requirements? And more importantly, you know, as the, uh, as the time goes on, it, we expect the issuers to update the market on where they are on these plans. Uh, often, you know, we would see 10 press releases saying we're in, we're, we're going down a path and then no real, uh, no real follow up to say we're, we're shelving that plan or that plan's going to cost, um, you know, X dollars and take us X amount of time. And that's a long time and a lot of money and neither wish they have. So certainly an area that, that we like to keep people focused on <clears throat> related party transactions. I'm sure that uh, there will be a groan in the room because this is a consistent uh, 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 topic. And I think I always try to say that the financial statements really, when they look at, at um, related party transaction, it's really the, the, the what and the, and the amount. And what we're looking for on the MD&A side is who was it paid to, why was it paid, and how was value determined. So it really just fills in a bit more of the story. Uh, as it relates to related parties. Getting into the bit more of the emerging areas, um, one area we're really kind of focused on and I think um, you know both Guy and Peter had mentioned was fintech. Uh, we, we have very a various aspects, bitcoins, tokens, <coughs> cryptocurrencies. I called it a block party. Uh, you know there's just there's so much that's based on blockchain technology and trying to bring in attributes to that industry or uh, various um, concepts of blockchain back to to some other uh, use in a public uh, public vehicle so we're seeing a lot of issuers that have come up with a lot of interesting things as it relates to either blockchain technology or really just being in the bitcoin token and and cryptocurrency space so that's a big area for us um, highlighting it it's an industry with more questions than answers um, I think that uh, probably as a as a um, an accounting um, the account, various accounting and regulatory bodies are struggling with this because there's not a lot out there in the international uh, space in terms of how to account for these uh, and how to account for the specifics. Um, I know that we percolate some of this stuff up to the international side, and they just look at it and go, "You guys, sh we have enough." Current standards, you should be able to figure it out. And I, I think we're struggling as um, not just regulators, but I know that, that, that CBA Canada is struggling a bit to understand what should be the path forward as it relates to, uh, to, to the crypto world and fintech. So I'd, I'd say stay tuned here. Um, but a plug for our BC tech team is, um, you know, we're certainly uh, we're cognizant of this emerging area. We've dedicated a team to dealing with issuers who want to be in this space and see how uh, securities legislation overlaps and, and whether it applies or doesn't apply. Um, so we have a, a dedicated team that works on this. And, and um, you know, as, as with all my comments, you know, kind of when in doubt, reach out. We're, we're happy to have a conversation. And uh, we find that um, 
it's a good way to educate issuers. Those that are in this space or actually moving, you know, that, that have tangible ideas and tangible products are moving very, very quickly. So the more we can get out and talk to them, we can, uh, we can uh, not necessarily slow them down, but, uh, you know, kind of bring the securities legislation aspect into their worlds and have them think about things that could trip them up down the road or find ways that could make it easier for them to be in the public realm. So, uh, you know, we're always happy to talk. Marijuana. Well, I, I did, uh, I used to have this now mainstream in Canada with a question mark, but I don't think there's any question marks. It is mainstream. It's out there. Um, since October 17th, it's, it's now legal. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's a day that doesn't go by where you don't see some business headlines as it relates to cannabis and the cannabis space. Um, I think um, I was reading today, Bolson Coors came out with their earnings in the U.S. today and, of course, had mentioned the concept of that they're developing some sort of cannabis drink. And, you know, we, we've seen it all over. Uh, various mentioning uh, they're going to be in the cannabis space or somehow linked to the cannabis space. So, um, you know, this is not an industry that's going to go away. I think it's just going to gain more and more. Probably the, the one interesting thing to me, um, you know, be, from the accounting side is, is I have a vision that Canada is really going to set the stage for, for cannabis uh, accounting. Uh, although it's a biological assets and and you know I think if the if the international folks would have a view they'd say well we've already got enough standards that deal with it and and it it's it, it can be covered but I think the nuances of how cannabis accounting will evolve will come from Canada I think obviously we're a world leader we're not the first country in the in the world to legalize it on a recreational and medical basis but I think we're the largest and that's that's gonna you know really um, uh, put the burden on us going uh, down the road to develop um, consistent and um, um, I guess um, full thought out um, policies and, and how we're gonna account for it. Is there still the Trump effect? Of course I think uh, Trump has been fairly silent on it um, his uh, his attorney general had been um, been fairly vocal on it, but he's been pretty quiet lately, and I, I think he's happy to stay quiet because I don't think he's been the subject of a tweet for almost two or three months. So I think he's just happy to lie low. I think they're still trying to figure it out on the political side how how they view cannabis, given the the dichotomy between the federal and state uh, regulators in their in their view of of cannabis uh, still is a schedule one uh, drug that uh, that is illegal at the federal level so we'll we'll still imp impact Canada and how we deal with the US uh, as it relates to cannabis and and some of those industries and kind of stay tuned from our perspective in in terms of the regulatory world we took a view early on and I think we expressed that view <clears throat> that we felt the cannabis space was was an area that could be dealt with through disclosure. Um, you know, it wasn't for us to step in and, and, and deal with the merits of cannabis. Uh, we just wanted to, to put a framework together that, uh, that dealt with more of the disclosure side of it. So we've issued the, as Peter had said, uh, staff knows 51352, which was our, just our expectations uh, for issuers with US activities. A lot of that disclosure about risks, disclosure about legal framework, and disclosure that you have uh, all applicable uh, licenses necessary in the jurisdiction you're operating in. Um, in terms of the the our recent staff notice, which was um, uh, based on our issue oriented review, uh, it got a fair bit of press. Um, you know, uh, talking about the I guess the the press uh, kind of related it to be uh, disclosure failures and I think what we felt when we did the the actual review and looked at things it was just an evolving area I think it's a very new industry um, and it, it's really just showing its growing pains as as different issuers account for things different ways um, you know I, I think uh, our staff notice tries to identify areas where we want to get a bit more transparency and a bit more consistency in disclosure but uh, certainly we recognize that it's a, it's a new industry and a new area that's, that's going to take time to evolve uh, as it relates to disclosure. So I guess stay tuned with that. But there's, there's a lot of good information in that staff notice uh, that I think will benefit ish, uh, issuers in the space. 
<clears throat> Switching gears, and I know that uh, this has been a topic I brought up in the last two sessions, and it's relating to regulatory burden. Uh, in, in April 2017, we put out a consultation paper as it related to uh, regulatory burden, uh, where we were looking to identify areas of securities legislation which um, could be ripe for uh, reduction of burden without um, uh, compromising investor protection or affecting the efficiency of the capital markets. When we put out that stat, uh, consultation paper, we kind of had five buckets in in, in areas that I, I put up as possibilities, you know, expanding streamlined rules, reducing burden within the offering process, um, disclosure requirements, um, el eliminating disclosure overlap and enhancing electronic de delivery. In terms of what we heard, we got about 57 comment letters. Um, the feedback was varied depending on the, the who the stakeholders were, whether it was issuers, advisors, um, or advocates, both um, for the issuer side and also the investor side. Um, but what we tried to do was synthesize key themes from the consultation paper. We took it away. Um, we tried to develop um, projects that we thought uh, had uh, reasonable um, room for success. Um, and also balancing the reducing burden and, um, and uh, investor protection. In terms of where we are, we've put those six uh, projects uh, kind of uh, in motion and um, we're hoping to, to, to uh, make some progress on each of those projects. We split them up basically just to make them manageable, um, even though they're, they're really under one umbrella, which is the reducing burden. In terms of the six buckets that we put forth and are working on currently, um, there's um, alternative prospectus model, um, which is really trying to come up with a more streamlined uh, offering system, whether it's prospectus based or some other um, you know uh, basis of offering. And wh what we're trying to do is develop something that could be more uh, tied to um, actual continuous disclosure. Issuers have to put out a lot of information in the public realm, and we're trying to recognize that as, as a base for uh, potential offerings and um, trying to uh, re reduce um, both the time it takes and the cost involved to go to market. Facilitating ATM offerings. ATM is uh, short for at the market. Here was a very specific um, um, project that wasn't actually proposed other than questions in the consultation paper, but we got enough feedback that said there was an inequality between um, the US and Canadian as it related to ATM offerings. So we're trying to true those up and it really becomes a bit of a codification of some of the areas we've been granting relief on, but it was felt that it was an area that could reduce burden in a fairly quick time frame. So we took that on. Business acquisition reporting, remove or modify. That uh, that's an area that uh, we uh, we often get grumbling on our uh, suggestion box in the uh, in the coffee room. I don't know how issuers get in, but uh, you know it's 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 always one that's that's been high on the list. High on the list in in really you know the venture issuer space and 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 BC where we're seeing a lot of uh, capital raised by small and medium enterprises so that's an area we're tr we're trying to tackle and um, you know we're quite hopeful that we can come up with something quite quick on that um, revisiting the primary business requirements here uh, when we went out in the consultation it was noted inconsistency of treatment across the country of the concept of primary business so we're trying to land on a consistent um, uh, theme and message here uh, CD requirements. This is a bit of a longer term um, project because uh, it, it encompasses a lot of uh, topics, how we can reduce disclosure that's already in other documents or in IFRS, how we could um, actually look at our documents in, in, in isolation and could we put them all together in some form of annual and quarterly report. So not separate MDNA financial statements and the concept of AIF. We could could we do something that's even more robust on a, on an ongoing basis? Um, so we're going to look at that one. Try to break it down into manageable parts. Um, so a bit of a phased approach and electronic delivery. Here we're really trying to kind of catch up with technology. I mean, obviously technology. Uh, you know, t in today's day and age, uh, more of it's electronic than it is. Uh, than actual uh, physical delivery in 
it was quite interesting because you know a, this this postal strike has kind of popped its its head up and it comes around about every I think about every five years but I think it, it's becoming less and less of an issue I think you know when I hear uh, you know uh, say 10 years ago when we heard postal strike I mean that was it was a calamity but now I think it's you know the biggest impact I heard last week is that's how the marijuana is getting delivered. So, you know, it kind of, <laughs> and, and it, I think it seemed to be a bargaining chip. It's like, well, you know, most of the marijuana that, that's, that's being ordered, uh, like, you know, in the Ontario space is being delivered by Canada Post. So that had an impact uh, when it came to um, postal delivery. So go figure, we come a long ways, but uh, somehow we evolve. I, I kind of think about electronic delivery and then I think, well, I guess... Marijuana's kind of revitalized something else in our economy in terms of uh, taking care of people. So, um, wow, I don't know how the, this snuck in here. This is an ongoing theme of mine. Quarterly highlights, a quick plug. I think I try to sneak a couple of slides in every year. Um, and, and I don't even try to change them. I just rotate them in. So uh, I always want to do a quick plug. I think this goes back to my venture issuer proportionate regulation project where we came up with the, the concept of quarterly highlights MDNA for, for venture issuers. So I always want to put these out and say, you know, here, we're, we're always open to, uh, to more uptake on this. Has there been any increase in the uptake? Not really. Uh, you know, I, I did a search last week and we're still at about a, under 100 issuers across across Canada. So um, it's certainly there. It's 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 there for the taking. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions by phone on this. You know, I, I think I want to be a big proponent of it because I, I, I do see a lot of benefit for venture issuers. Um, and of course, I'm always sounding like Charlie Brown's teacher on that one. In terms of other initiatives, <clears throat> just kind of wrapping it up of where we are, where we're going in the future. We have a consultation on reducing burden for investment funds. So that just takes that regulatory burden project and um, focuses on as it relates to investment funds. So that's something we're working on. Uh, climate disclosure project. We did an update earlier in the summer, just letting issuers know and stakeholders know where we are with that project. Um, it's still going to be a, a, a bit of a, a a longer term project i think there's more fact finding and uh and gathering of information before that um that disclosure project goes too too much farther down the road but um uh, what we're trying to do is gather the information and see if there's a an efficient way that uh, we can either address it or determine that it, we're not the right spot to be addressing it non-gap measures um the rule was put out for comment in september um i kind of encourage anyone and everyone to take a look at it and and perhaps think about commenting it's quite a robust um, uh, rule now where it used to be a staff notice and uh, the joke used to be 52306 was a revised staff notice that somehow got revised four times over 10 years so I, th I think as regulators we looked at it and said maybe it's time to put this in as a rule so we proposed a rule it's out for comment um, there's a fairly um, uh, 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 an extensive package that, that looks at the rule, the companion policy, and some guidance out there. So I encourage everyone to take a look at it. And uh, if it does affect you, by all means, um, send in comment letters. Um, because, that, you know, I think, as you know, we, we, can't, um, we can't take directions or, or, or move the needle uh, unless our, our stakeholders comment. So uh, that's something we're always looking for, looking for is more commentary. Um, other policy projects, I think women on boards is, is another area that we're still kind of working on and seeing what the right regulatory um, participation or impact should be. Um, the National Systems Renewal Project, this is updating SEDI, CDAR. Uh, and I just kind of wanted to bring that uh, up and say that the first phase of this, uh, this project is, is uh, looking to replace CDAR. And um, you know, our targeted date is uh, 2020 to have that in place. So that's that's something not necessary to uh, to dwell on now, but know that it's coming down the road. And as we get closer, we'll we'll have more updates on that. CMRA um, 
probably something that uh, I think in, internally we don't focus a lot on in terms of, of trying to figure out time frames. It's a political situation driven by government, both federal and provincials trying to um, trying to figure out a time frame on that. But just wanted to uh, let you know it's still out there. It's something that we're working on internally to the extent that 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 we have guidance from the. Uh, both the federal and provincial governments. I know that um, the head of um, the, the the head of uh, CMAIO, which is going to be the CMRA CMRA uh, oversight body, uh, spoke yesterday to the government, giving them an out, uh, an update in one of the uh, committee meetings. So it's still out there. Um, kind of stand by. Uh, we're, we'll we'll see where that one goes. Um, but I, I didn't want to shy away from letting you know it's still on the table, just on a uh, no defined path uh, in terms of timelines.